everyone. Welcome to our first uh, patient facing event that's in person since the pandemic. We have missed seeing you in person. So thank you for taking the time to come in. I also wanted to thank the participants who are um, Zooming in virtually. We, we are also thrilled that you're with us. I'm Dr. Miriam Lusberg. I'm Chief of Breast Oncology and Director of the Breast Center, and I will be hosting the program tonight. We have a few exciting presentations for you tonight. Um, there'll be ample time for questions, um, both after each presentation and after all the presentations have been completed. So really, this program is meant to be for you. And so um, just think about your questions as the presentations are going on and um, we, we're happy to hear from you. Uh, if you're here, feel free to raise your hand. If you're virtual, feel free to um, drop your question in the chat and we'll be sure to answer them. So the idea behind this program was to give you a flavor of all the various disciplines that um, that make up the multidisciplinary care of um, breast cancer. This is a team sport. We all work very closely together and um, center and forefront um, is all of you. So our first presentation, I uh, will give you uh, an update on cancer genetics and its importance in breast cancer care. And I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dr. Vida Geary, who is the uh, Director of Cancer Genetics here at SMILO. Dr. Geary? Great. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for the introduction. And, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, and it's wonderful to have a, an event like this finally in person again and have the option for people to remote in. So it's, uh, it's uh, the way going forward and I'm so glad to be here to engage with you all. So thank you for the time. I'm gonna be talking about breast cancer genetic testing. I'm a medical oncologist and I specialize in um, the genetics of cancers, genetic testing, genetic counseling. How do we identify if there's a genetic change um, that has led to these cancers, uh, increased risk of cancers happening? Um, and what can we do about some of these um, findings? How does it factor into the care for patients? Um, it'll be a very general overview. And um, certainly if there's any questions, please ask and um, we can take it from there. So I'm actually gonna be talking about genetic testing for breast cancer, why, who, and how. So going forward. So um, the American Cancer Society puts out statistics about cancers on a yearly basis. Uh, the frequency of these cancers arising, such as incidence, and then estimated rates of dying from prostate cancer, the death rates from cancers in the United States on a yearly basis. These are the estimates from 2022 from the American Cancer Society. And we do see here once again that lung, uh, breast cancer is ranked uh, number one in terms of incidence for females of cancer. So number one cancer for diagnosis. And then second in terms of um, uh, death from uh, cancer being from breast cancer as well. This makes it an absolutely critical cancer to address and uh, look at from lots of different aspects and avenues, one of them being from a genetic standpoint. So if we get right into the why, and I'm gonna actually take a very high level view of the why because we have Dr. Greenup from surgery is going to be talking about surgical management for breast cancer. Uh, of course, Dr. Lusberg from medical oncology, but I just wanna talk about where the integration of genetics is in the care of breast cancer. And so the why for genetic testing, why think about genetic testing for individuals? One reason is that it can impact breast cancer screening. So some specific genetic mutations, and I'll be talking about two of the common breast cancer genes referred to as BRCA1, BRCA2, or BRCA1, BRCA2, um, impacting age in which to start breast cancer screening. It would be much younger than the general population to start screening for breast cancer for uh, a woman who carries a BRCA mutation. 
There's also the question of whether to add um, other screening modalities in addition to mammogram, for example, breast MRI. So it impacts the strategy for screening if we know the genetic mutation information. This is hereditary cancer genetic testing. So what we are interested in finding out is, was there a genetic change? And I'll talk about like what a mutation is in just a moment. Was there a genetic mutation or a genetic change that was inherited and that could lead to cancers arising in families? And so therefore this can have impact not only for the patient in front of us, but also thinking about genetic testing in their blood relatives. So siblings, children, uh, aunts, uncles, parents, et cetera. The genetic information can also be very helpful in early stage breast cancer for thinking about surgical decision making. So do these patients, if there is a genetic mutation, would there be consideration for uh, what's called more local, uh, address, locally addressing the breast cancer with surgery versus thinking of a uh, mastectomy, double mastectomy? And these are important questions that a breast surgeon is thinking of uh, when they see patients and where the genetic information could also be really helpful. And then in terms of treatment of breast cancer, this field has really just exploded in terms of thinking of genetic information informing treatment of women with breast cancer. This can be what's called adjuvant targeted treatment, which means after surgery is performed, thinking of incorporation of targeted therapies based on information of genetic mutations or in the setting of um, much more advanced or metastatic breast cancer, where this opens the door for agents such as PARP inhibitors, uh, even in the adjuvant setting, for more options for how to treat metastatic breast cancer. So the why is really encompassing all four of these domains in terms of thinking of why we see patients for genetic testing and genetic counseling. So therefore, who is recommended to consider genetic testing? And these are from the uh, national guidelines, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. This is, they're very specific. There's a lot of criteria for genetic testing, but if we distill it down into some of the more um, sort of uh, general features for thinking of genetic testing, women with a breast cancer diagnosis who are diagnosed at age less than or equal to 50 would be um, individuals who would be considering genetic testing. Certainly, as I mentioned, if their uh, treatment doctors or surgeons are thinking of how this might impact their treatment um, or management, that could be another reason. Uh, features of the cancer itself. So one type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer, meaning that the markers that are often checked for are not seen in the breast tissue itself and therefore um, could indicate a reason for genetic testing. Multiple primary breast cancers. So somebody that has re, uh, multiple breast cancers could have been having that occur because of a genetic mutation. And so uh, those patients are referred for genetic testing. And then patients of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry because of the higher rates of BRCA mutations in particular um, in patients of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. And then for women with or without breast cancer diagnosis themselves, family history becomes really important. So thinking about a family history of multiple cancers, um, you know, we often may think about just a family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer, but actually these genes that we test for can cross over into multiple cancer types. There can be cancers in males, there can be cancers in females in the family. So it's important to think of family history broadly, so breast cancer, and especially if there was any blood relative that had breast cancer diagnosed at a young age. Um, and certainly family history of ovarian cancer, male breast cancer, which is a very rare cancer in the population, but there are higher rates in, in families that have um, BRCA mutations, pancreatic cancer, and then prostate cancer, especially metastatic prostate cancer. And I'll talk about some of the genes that are uh, involved here in a lot of these different cancer types. So the how. We're going to go back to genetics 101 here. So we're in a classroom, we're in an auditorium, so we're going to do a little bit of genetics. And so when we're talking about uh, this type of genetic testing, as I mentioned, this is hereditary cancer testing. So if you recall, we have um, half of our DNA from our father, half of our DNA from our mother. And overall, this encompasses over 25,000 genes in our genomes. We have two copies of every gene. Here we see the mother who has two normal copies of a particular gene. And then you see the father has one normal copy and one abnormal copy. That's the open box. 
And with genetics, it's a, and with the type of genes that we're testing for called tumor suppressor genes, there's a 50% chance that each child could inherit um, the abnormal copy. So you see here, one son has inherited a normal copy from mom and an abnormal copy from dad. Here, the daughter inherited both normal copies a son inher inherited both normal copies, and a daughter inherited one normal copy, one abnormal copy. So knowing if there is a genetic mutation, even if a relative, like say a parent has a genetic mutation, it's a 50% chance for every child to have inherited that genetic mutation. It's like the flip of a coin. So you really don't know until you actually do the genetic testing. And this is why family history becomes so important because we're talking about this type of pattern of inheritance of cancers. So when we're talking about family history, we want to know several types of features, and family history can be hard to know, so it's just to the best of your knowledge. Um, what were the cancers? I ran through some of the cancers already, but all cancer types in males and females in the family are really important to know. If you have an estimate of about how old they were when they were diagnosed, were they in their 40s, in their 50s, in their 60s? That can be helpful information. Um, did they pass away from their cancer? Were they getting screening for cancer? These are some of the things. Were there other factors that could have impacted cancer development, such as the relative had lung cancer and they were a heavy smoker? You know, just that type of information to help us um, get an idea about what's the suspicion for a hereditary risk in a family. And as I mentioned, this is very detailed family history information, but it's to the best of your knowledge, you know, that you know. We know that there's communication uh, patterns that can limit how much information we know about uh, some of these things like cancer family history. And so when we're talking about genetic testing, what are we really talking about? So as I mentioned, we're testing the genetic material, the DNA. And so when we're talking about this type of the, the genes that we have, you can think of a gene as a word in the English language. So words carry meaning. The genes send signals to our cells. They tell our cells when to grow, when to die, um, and how to function. So just like a word in the English language, if you go from the word tree and you substitute the letter uh, F for the letter T, you completely change the meaning of the word. You're going from tree to free, completely different meaning. The same thing can happen in a gene. If you change the code of a gene, you can actually change the signal that is being sent to the cells. Um, and then, or you can make it nonsense. So you can go from tree, T-R-E-E -E, to T-X-E-E, -E, and that has no meaning. <clears throat> same thing with a gene. If you make a substitution, you can actually, uh, Make, this, the, make it nonsense, that it stops sending the signals. And this is really important because most of the cancer genes that we test for are called tumor suppressor genes. They are genes that actually are supposed, their normal function is to stop cancers from happening. So if you get in the way of those signals, um, if, if a mutation gets in the way of those signals, it can, uh, the, the process gets interrupted and that can lead to an increased predisposition for cancers. So this type of genetic testing can be done on a blood sample or a saliva sample or even a cheek swab sample. Um, that sample is then sent to a qualified genetic testing laboratory to perform the genetic testing. And then the results return and are discussed with, uh, with patients. So when we're talking about genetic mutations, this is the type of change that we're interested in finding where there is a change in a gene that is associated with diseases like cancer. Common genes on breast cancer panels are shown here. So um, I mentioned BRCA1 and BRCA2, BRCA1 or BRCA2. As you can see here, a big reason for referral of patients to um, genetic evaluation is to think about, you know, what is the risk of breast cancer? Is there an impact, let's say, on surgical decision making? So we see here that BRCA1 and BRCA2, of course, are associated with breast cancer risk. There are strong guidelines that to factor this information in for discussions with the breast surgeon for surgical decision making. And then also you can see here, there's additional cancer risks that can be associated with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. And therefore, not only do we wanna talk about the risk of let's say a second breast cancer or ovarian cancer, but we wanna talk about, are we uncovering risk of pancreatic cancer as well? And what can we do about that for a patient? Are we uncovering risks for prostate cancer in male blood relatives uh, or melanoma? And what can we do about that? All of the genes that we test for, as you can see here, there can be um, additional cancer risks that are associated, and there may or may not be some impact on surgical decision-making, the strength of that association, uh, depending on the guidelines. And all of them are associated with breast cancer risk. So we're able to do multi-gene testing these days, not just for BRCA1 and 2, but actually for many more genes.
And there's different types of results that can return. Obviously, the one thing that we're looking for are called mutations or pathogenic variants. This is what I've just already been talking about, where there's a change in a gene that is associated with diseases like cancer. Here, we would be making recommendations based on that information and would be making recommendations to test blood relatives. There's another type of result, which is an uncertain finding or a variant of uncertain significance, VUS. So these are genetic changes where it's still just not known at the time that they're reported, whether this is a mutation or just a silent change that does nothing. And so it's still reported to patients and there's no management changes based upon the finding of a VUS in the report. And most of the time, the results will actually come back negative. There was no mutations or VUS is found. And therefore we still make recommendations based on family history. So to end with, let's walk a patient through the genetic evaluation process and what are the steps involved. And again, again, this is just a very sort of a summary view of this. And so when we uh, have a patient referred to us, this could actually happen, um, the, the initiation of this discussion for genetic testing can actually be happening in the tra traditional way, which is with a genetic counselor, and I'll talk about who that is in just a moment, or even with physicians, and, and it's really important to understand that your healthcare provider, your surgeon, your medical oncologist is an in integral part of this process and care team. Many times the um, physicians are actually initiating the genetic testing these days because the patients in need of genetic testing has gone up so significantly too. A genetic counselor is a master's level trained health professional who is uh, trained in various aspects of genetic testing, understanding the types of genetic results that can return. What does the patient need to understand to make an informed decision for genetic testing? So um, that's sort of the classic model is to be referred for um, this discussion for um, genetic counseling. The patient completes the family history, as I mentioned, with all of the criteria that I just brought up. And that information is factored into the genetic testing. There's a lot to be discussed about genetic testing so that a patient can make an informed decision. So, you know, I'm not going to go over all this for the sake of time, but impact on therapy, cancer inheritance, what are the different options for genetic testing? What are the benefits and considerations? What are the genetic protection laws that are available? What do those laws protect and where are there no protections in place or lack of protections, data privacy, et cetera? So once this discussion is had, then a patient can make an informed decision and proceed with genetic testing. There's different ways of doing the genetic testing these days. So there's focused or guidelines panels where just a few genes would be tested where there's guidelines associated for management. And those rates of those uncertain findings are much lower. The more genes that you test, the greater those chances of those uncertain findings, um, that those chances go up as you can see here. So we can test guidelines, you know, focused genes, cancer specific panels like a breast cancer panel or a colon cancer panel and then comprehensive cancer panels that can include 80 to actually over 100 genes. But the more genes that you test, the more um, that's a lot of those genes may not have current guidelines. So a lot of times patients just wanna know more information and they're okay with uncertainty. Other patients are not okay with uncertainty. They just wanna know the information that they can do something about. So it really depends on that you know, discussion with the patient. There's also this reflex testing, which means we can start with an initial set of genes and then reflex to a greater panel of genes um, based on family history and additional information. And then finally, the disclosure. So the results return and recommendations based on genetic information. So for example, if we get a result back of a mutation or a pathogenic variant in BRCA2, as you can see here, there's a host of recommendations that we would be talking about with a patient that would change compared to, let's say, um, the general population screening. So for breast cancer, clinical breast exam starting at age 25, breast MRI uh, once a year starting at ages 25 to 29, um, consider risk-reducing mastectomy based on personal and family history. And of course, if there's breast cancer uh, for adjuvant therapy or metastatic treatment as well. Same here for ovarian cancer. And then importantly is to think about what this means for males and females as well. So there would be recommendations in terms of addressing male breast cancer, prostate cancer screening, and then for both males and females, pancreatic cancer screening and melanoma, especially if there's a family history of pancreatic cancer. And very, very importantly, if we identify a genetic mutation in a patient, we would then talk about what's called cascade testing or testing of blood relatives to see if they inherited the genetic mutation, to think about the recommendations that would be relevant for them um, and their uh, family members as well. 
So uh, we do have a very large cancer genetics program here at uh, Yale Medicine Smilo Cancer Hospital. Um, it's a um, team of experts that is seeing patients across um, Connecticut. So not just in New Haven, but in multiple of the Yale New Haven Health System hospitals. And um, I've got our contact information there. If you ever would like to reach us, please feel free. Um, and we go through this genetic evaluation process with our patients, um, again, in concert with our um, uh, referring doctors. So thank you very much for your time. And one of the other things that I want to end with is the how is how can we make things better, you know, for our patients. And so we're constantly thinking of new programs and research to address things like cancer disparities, access to care, um, support that patients need as they're going through this process. So uh, we'd love to engage with you more. And thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Geary. Um, any questions from the audience or online? Yes, so that's a really good question. So yes, most insurance plans will cover genetic testing based on the national guidelines. So they try to align between the two. So most of the insurance plans are good about it, but not every single one. So part of this process becomes checking with insurance to see if the genetic testing cost is covered by the insurances. I will say also that the cost out of pocket cost for genetic testing has come down significantly. Used to be like $3,000 to get genetic testing. It's come down to about 200 to $250 for the most part in some of the well-experienced laboratories. That can still be a financial hardship, but, but it is an option that, that is there as well if insurance doesn't cover. Great. All right, and I'll be sure to repeat the question next time for the online audience. Um, all right, we'll move on to our next speaker. I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Rachel Greenup, who is an Associate Professor of Surgery here at Yale and Chief of Breast Surgery and a close colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Greenup. Yeah, yeah. Two, 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 two. All right, let me make sure this is all set. Well, good evening. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of updates in breast cancer surgery in 10 minutes or less. But I usually start with this slide. I think one of the things that um, those of us who entered breast surgical oncology and, and breast oncology in general are most proud of is that we've made incredible evidence-based progress over the last 50 years. Um, but it's really put our patients at the center of our research. And this is an old slide showing initially a woman who had a radical mastectomy, which was an incredibly aggressive and disfiguring operation. Um, and we stopped doing those for the most part because we learned that for so many of our patients, lumpectomy with radiation was equally effective. Similarly, we used to have to do aggressive lymph node dissections for women with any amount of lymph node disease, but we had good data starting in 2010, 2011 that we could forego completion lymph node dissections in eligible patients with small amount of tumor in their nodes and that reduced the number of lymph node dissections and downstream lymphedema that was a long-term side effect so many patients suffered from. More recently, we've identified a population of women 70 and older with favorable hormone receptor positive breast cancers who could comfortably and safely forego radiation therapy after lumpectomy. And we've decided and determined a population of women with hormone receptor positive breast cancers who no longer benefit from chemotherapy, but can take endocrine therapy alone. And we have ongoing data to try and identify a population of women with ductal carcinoma in situ who may not need typical surgery and radiation, but can comfortably and safely undergo active surveillance. And that's a COMET trial that we do have an open here at Yale. 
So when I meet many of my patients for the first time as a breast cancer surgeon, women come in typically with a diagnosis that's often been detected by screening mammogram and or ultrasound with a subsequent biopsy demonstrating cancer. And I want to start by talking about screening because we do have a lot of controversy across the country at various times that hits the lay press about what frequency screening should be done at and in whom. Um, generally, our team and most cancer centers across the country follow the American Cancer Society guidelines, and this includes that women ages 40 and over should be considered for annual mammography. Um, and if they have a higher risk, we can consider supplemental imaging. These uh, data and recommendations also suggest that some women 55 and older may be able to go undergo mammogram every two years, but or have the choice to continue yearly screening. In 2019, our American Society of Breast Surgery addressed this controversy, and I, I think these guidelines are really special in that they not only identify the patient's personal and family history, but they also address breast density and the option for supplemental a digital 3D mammography with screening, ultrasound, and or breast MRI. And so this really has encouraged our surgical community to think about the patient as a whole and to talk to women about the pros and cons of additional or more frequent imaging. So I had a conversation in clinic this afternoon with a patient that MRI is really sensitive, um, really um, sophisticated, and yet a bit of a double-edged sword. It can pick up on things that are not cancer and lead to additional biopsies and associating anxiety if we over-screen. When we talk about screening and move on to breast cancer surgery, we still have options for many of our early stage patients. So this is a medical illustration demonstrating lumpectomy followed by radiation, which is also known as breast conserving surgery versus mastectomy. And you can see the woman on this uh, slide it was closed flat. Dr. Butler's here and he's gonna talk more about the amazing options for our patients who desire post-mastectomy reconstruction. We know that these two treatment options are equally effective and we have good long-term data showing that. The term breast conservation typically means that we do what's called a lumpectomy and radiation. This is removing the tumor and radiating the healthy breast tissue left behind. And often we cannot visibly see the cancer or the cancer cells. So we rely on our amazing radiology colleagues to help us find the spot. We used to need to do that by putting a wire in a woman's breast. And for some of our patients, that's still the best technique, but we're now using more advanced uh, technology, including radio frequency ID tags. They're smaller. They go in a few days before the patient's surgery. Women can go home. And we have good data showing that it prompts a surgeon to take smaller resection volumes, have better luck with negative margins, and that it's more comfortable for women and improves their patient satisfaction. We've also had a controversy in our surgical community. I'm sorry, the formatting of my slides is a little off, but um, around margins after lumpectomy and how much distance between the tumor cells and the healthy tissue is enough. And I always like to highlight this work because Yale was really extraordinarily impactful in the national conversation around this issue. Prior to the work done by Drs. Mina Moran and Dr. Anise Chagpar, the reexcision rates after lumpectomy ranged from 15 to 25%. And believe it or not, about half of women were going back to have surgery for negative margins, meaning their second surgery took out healthy breast tissue that was not necessary. We didn't know what the right answer was. There was no consensus and across the country, both surgeons and radiation oncologies were considering negative margins in different ways. And so Dr. Moran, who's the head of radiation oncology here in our breast center, convened a multidisciplinary panel from experts across the country. They reviewed 33 studies, which included almost 30,000 patients. And they ultimately found that as long as there was not cancer right up to the edge of the, the tumor, which is what this picture shows, um, it could be called a negative margin. So we know that when the pathologists get the tissue from our patients, 
They can't tell us anything about what is left behind in a woman's breast. They can only comment on the tissue that was removed. And if they see positive margins or cancer right up to the edge of what was excised, and we move forward with radiation, women have a twofold higher risk of a recurrence. But we also know now that no tumor on ink is enough. So as long as the margin is ultimately negative, we can stop. This uh, data was further supported by a randomized clinical trial that Dr. Chagpar ran and was published in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is arguably our most uh, respected medical journal in the world. And this trial was small, but it was important because it was the first and only randomized trial addressing this controversy. She showed that when surgeons removed the breast tumor and then went back to take additional shavings of the lumpectomy cavity, it reduced the margin positivity rate by 50%. This is now the national standard of care. And my research with support from others in my lab showed that it eliminated about 25,000 surgeries a year among women in the Medicare program, saving the health system about $34 million. And importantly, eight to 10% of women who had to go back for re-excision would convert to mastectomy that they probably never needed. Mastectomy, uh, shifting gears is removal of all the breast tissue with or without reconstruction. And um, again, there are options for no reconstruction. I tell my patients, this is your choice. It's not medically necessary, but we have wonderful research showing that quality of life is improved with post-mastectomy reconstruction. Our reconstructive surgeons can use autologous tissue, which is women's own tissue, either from their abdomen or their muscle. And we do a lot of implant-based reconstruction here as well. There's been a lot of controversy in the last 10 years about the benefit of double mastectomy and the medical term for removing a healthy breast is also known as contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. We know the rates of this in average risk women, so different than the population we heard about with genetic mutations, has tripled um, from 1998 to 2012. We know that there's no cancer or survival benefit and that there is a higher risk of surgical complications. Yet many of our patients um, suggest that the surveillance, the idea of going back for a mammogram after a breast cancer diagnosis is profoundly anxiety provoking. We have research showing that symmetry really matters to patients and is often improved if women do both sides. And many women report this concept of peace of mind, not being able to sleep at night if they're worrying about their breast. And so importantly, our American Society of Breast Surgeons came forward with a guidance statement in 2016 saying that we should discourage average risk women with unilateral breast cancer from having a double mastectomy, but most importantly, patients' values, goals, and preferences should be included to optimize shared decision. And that the final decision is the result of the balance between benefits and risks and ultimately patient preference. We do a lot of nipple sparing mastectomies here. This picture in the upper left part of the slide is a CT, micro CT anatomic studies done by my mentor, Barbara Smith at Mass General Hospital showing first that the blood supply to the skin of the nipple ran laterally and the ductal tissue ran centrally. And that allowed surgeons to feel comfortable that we could remove most of the ducts and still maintain a blood, su blood supply for our reconstructive surgeons. When we're thinking about candidacy for nipple sparing mastectomy, we need to think about distance of the tumor to the nipple, the patient's skin quality, tumor size, and more, most importantly, we've realized that even our higher risk patients with BRCA mutations are probably eligible for this risk-reducing operation. This picture here is an MRI showing that there's likely tumor right behind the nipple. And she's probably someone I would discourage from ha having nipple sparing mastectomy because of course, cancer treatment needs to come first. We're really excited to announce that last week we launched our first uh, home recovery after mastectomy program. And um, I wanted to highlight that because it was really an interdisciplinary effort. When COVID happened, we started as a community across the United States, recognizing that our healthy patients after mastectomy might be safer at home. And so many programs were doing mastectomy with or without reconstruction. 
watching women for a longer time period in the recovery room after surgery, but sending them home to be cared for by friends and families with support from visiting nurses and really good education. And we decided to do the same program at Yale, but to also be really thoughtful and get feedback from key stakeholders. This is for eligible healthy patients who live near the hospital who want to go home and not everybody does. And we're actually in our research working on identifying women that feel emotionally ready to recover at home versus women who might be more comfortable in the hospital overnight. It also means that we're connecting our patients with a visiting nurse who will check on them the evening of surgery. So they almost have a nurse at home making sure that they're okay and who can communicate back to their operative team if issues arise. We have good uh, data to show that the risk of complications after surgery is no higher if women go home, that keeping people in the hospi hospital doesn't help with amounts of pain medication they use, their risk of bleeding, their risk of being admitted again. Um, and so for patients that feel more comfortable recovering in the comfort of their home, we now have a program in place to support them. Moving on to lymph node evaluation, I did touch on the ACOZOG-Z11 trial. This was the first study in 2011 showing that in women who have lumpectomy, who we know will go on to radiation, small amounts of lymph node disease did not necessarily warrant a full axillary lymph node dissection. And moving that forward, we've also identified a population of women who have positive lymph nodes after chemotherapy that may be able to rely on radiation alone. This is the Alliance 11202 trial, and we're long awaiting these data. All's to say is we continue to identify opportunities to normalize patient experience as best we can and to hold back on unnecessary surgery that may cause patients harm. Dr. Um, Geary did a great job talking about genetic testing and I am by no means the expert, but uh, we have changed how we think about access to genetic testing in our breast cancer patients. This was a study by Peter Beitch and essentially he and his study team identified that when you serially test women with a newly diagnosed breast cancer, we were missing women that probably warranted genetic testing when compared to women who were screened only according to national guidelines. And so again, our breast surgery society um, came forward with a very valuable guidance statement saying that women with breast cancer should all be allowed to have access to consideration of testing, even if they do not formally meet the NCCN criteria. I think lastly, we have also had really important findings in the last two years around how we manage tumors in the breast for women with metastatic disease. And in the past, we thought about removing the primary tumor as a way to potentially improve long-term survival or quality of life. This study was led by Seema Khan at Northwestern, and they actually randomized women who were diagnosed initially with metastatic breast cancer. Half of them went on to have surgery, the other half did not. And they looked at survival, local recurrence, and quality of life as outcome measures. Women could have either lumpectomy or mastectomy. They were treated with chemotherapy or home hormone therapy according to recommendations from their doctors. And the axillary management as well was left to the discretion of the surgeon. And ultimately, we found that removing the primary breast tumor in women with metastatic disease did not extend survival among women with newly diagnosed breast cancer. We still occasionally discuss these patients at our conference. I'm always happy to meet with these women to talk about the pros and cons, but our science has again shown us that we can do less. Thank you for having me, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? Yes. Repeat the question. 
So the question was about um, advertisements from uh, other local hospitals um, marketing the Sentinel lymph node mapping, and we do that at Yale here. Um, so Sentinel node biopsy was first validated in the 1990s, so we've been doing it for some time. And it's a way for us to make sure we don't have to take out unnecessary lymph nodes. Um, in the past, the lymph node information was really important data for the medical oncologist to make decisions about a need for chemotherapy. But we've learned over time that we have better ways to determine the biology of the cancer and that the lymph node information, although important, might not be the end all decision maker. Um, when we used to see any woman with any size breast cancer, we would routinely take out all the lymph nodes under their arm and it left a, an enormous population of women with lymphedema, which is a difficult long-term side effect. Sentinel node biopsy was first validated in melanoma and we borrowed that technology from the melanoma surgeons, believe it or not, but women go off to sleep in the operating room and we inject their breast with a blue dye that allows us to see the nodes and a clear dye that's radioactive and it sends a signal to the nodes. It doesn't track cancer cells. So we take out a sample and the sample is not lymph nodes that are involved with tumor. It's a sample that accurately tells us what's going on in the rest of the nodes without having to take them out. So if the sentinel node's normal, we can stop. And now we're learning that if the sentinel node has tumor, for many women, they don't need that more aggressive surgery. Oh, so this is a really good question about exercise and reducing breast cancer recurrence. And um, we talk to our patients about this all the time. Um, Dr. Tara Samft and Javin Britta, who's here in the audience with us tonight, who run our survivorship clinic, have been really um, thought leaders in the United States around the importance of exercise and diet and not only getting women through treatment, but also reducing their risk of recurrence. Um, number one, it keeps women at a healthy body weight. Number two, there's something very powerful about exercise itself. And um, we, we do talk to women about finding time every week to exercise for the benefit of reducing breast cancer recurrence but I'll, I'll let you uh, go tap the expert in the back of the room at the end of our session. Yes, the survivorship group has a nice panel and uh, yeah, a ton of data on benefits of exercise in terms of fatigue reduction for all stages of breast cancer as well. So um, lots to talk about there and we can even plan a session specifically on that. So I'll be doing two mini talks for you. One is a brief introduction to clinical trials in Yale um, in our breast program. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm Miriam Lusberg, Chief of Breast Oncology here. And um, I'd like all of us to kind of ponder the statement, which is um, so important, which is every current treatment that all of you have had at some point was a prior clinical trial. This is the only way we can make advances in the care of our patients with breast cancer. And, um, you know, if anything, going way back to tamoxifen, to the type of breast surgeries that we're doing, the type of radiation that we're doing, everything has been tested previously in a clinical trial. And we continue to participate in clinical trials to continue to advance the science of breast cancer, and why do we do that? To continue to improve outcomes. And so how to get involved? Um, one is to be aware of the importance of clinical trials and just ask us. At every juncture in your treatment, we have wonderful standard therapy options, but it's also fair to ask, are there any clinical trial options that may be applicable to my situation at this juncture? So having a dialogue with us is important. And uh, when you get information about a clinical trial, taking the time to read and review it, it can be sometimes overwhelming, a lot of information. You don't have to process it all at once, but taking um, time to ask questions, and we're really here to help. Um, we are very active in clinical trials. This is something that we, we absolutely believe is the mission, uh, one of the central missions of the Yale Breast Program. So even in 
it, with all the issues that happened with COVID and restrictions, uh, we've, we've continued to be very active um, in clinical trials. And in 2021, we had over 300 of you participate in various clinical trials. And uh, to, up to, to today, today in 2022, um, 85 of you have participated. So thank you for the time. Um, sometimes people ask, well, what is a clinical trial? And this is um, the official definition from the uh, Federal Drug Association, but essentially there are, there, there are studies where uh, we're trying to find new answers to very specific health questions and specific to breast cancer. We're trying to find a better treatment that either works better or has better quality of life or both. And the ultimate goal is to improve your health outcomes. And the good news about breast cancer is that there have been so many new drugs and new treatments um, in, in the past few years. And as you can see, um, just from um, uh, you know, 2019 to what's projected, we're projecting a ton of new targeted therapies. And what does this mean? It means that there are new treatments on the horizon. And just in the past year, there have been multiple new drugs uh, that have been approved in breast cancer. Many of them tend to be actually smart drugs that we call targeted therapies, which work better than our traditional old fashioned chemotherapy agents. We're beginning to think, you know, you heard about the genetics that uh, Dr. Gary and Dr. Um, Greenup talked about. So those genes are testing your genetic makeup. We're also testing the breast tumor themselves for their genetic makeup because they could have very different characteristics than your own makeup. And what we're learning is that they can have multiple targets. For example, they could have targets that let us know that you may be a candidate for immunotherapy. You may be a candidate for some of these DNA repair um, drugs. So uh, as you speak to your medical oncologist and sometimes your surgeon and radiation oncologist, the idea of testing your tumor with what we call sequencing or next generation sequencing, this is something that we're actively doing in advanced breast cancer. And then, um, and there are times in early stage breast cancer, we may be uh, testing for very specific targets as well. You're not meant to read the slide, but the point of this slide is that no matter what your stage or type of breast cancer is, we have a trial for you. So this can be surgically based options, looking at a more innovative ways for um, managing uh, non-invasive uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. We have preoperative regimens where these are drugs that we give before surgery to help um, target your treatment. So then when you go to surgery, we can actually see how much tumor is left. Did we pick the right regimens? We have lots of re uh, regimens in the adjuvant setting, what happens after surgery. So, so again, for triple negative breast cancer, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer. And I really want to emphasize that we, we care deeply about our patients living with metastatic breast cancer and a number of our trials are targeting your unique needs um, in multiple lines of chemotherapy. So these options are available in addition to all the great standard therapies that may have been a clinical trial a year or two ago. And um, this, uh, these are the clinical trial staff members that you may interact with as we introduce clinical trials to you. They're, they're wonderful. Um, and uh, they, they, they really are, spend a lot of time with you, taking you through the process. Um, and you see there with my son, I'm the disease related um, breast dart leader. So, so we, we are really committed to serving you. And with that, are there any questions about clinical trials before I do a quick update on breast medical oncology? All right. So the next little whirlwind, if everybody needs to stretch or go to the bathroom, feel free. This is meant to be flexible. Uh, so what's new in breast medical oncology? Well, lots of things are new and I've been very selective in terms of what I'm presenting to you because I don't want to overwhelm you. And really the point is for you to have a little bit of awareness of what's new 
And then additional dialogue can be done with your primary teams. So the three chapters that I'll focus on are new drugs, new technologies, and also working on patient um, experiences. So new drugs. So the way we treat breast cancer has changed dramatically in the last decade, which is that we don't think about breast cancer as one disease anymore, but multiple subtypes or types of breast cancer. The most common being what we call the hormone receptor positive, um, and they, they can be further subdivided into luminal A, luminal B. We have HER2 positive tumors, or if all three markers are negative, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, that's known as triple negative. But even this slide is no longer accurate anymore, just in the last few months. Why? Because we're, when we used to think about HER2 positive versus HER2 negative, now we actually have a new category called HER2 low. So based on recent studies that have been reported, there are actually over a half of our breast cancers that actually carry a little bit of that HER2 signal. And we used to think that wasn't important. But now we think it is because we actually have drugs, new drugs that can actually treat these tumors. So what are these drugs? These are some of our smart drugs, and these are called antibody drug conjugates. Don't want to overwhelm you. Don't want to kind of make you get bogged down in details. But essentially, they have three parts. They have an antibody that goes after a protein or a marker on the top of the surface. They have something that links it to the rest of the cell. And then they have what we call the payload or the chemotherapy, and everything is smartly packaged to deliver itself in a good way in the body. And so I'll show you a cartoon. So let's say you have a HER2 positive cancer cell, the antibody binds, and then it gets absorbed into the tumor cell, and then things break apart and the chemocytotoxic agent actually gets released. The drug is released. And then that actually causes the tumor cell to die, but that's not the only effect. Then the, 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 the cytotoxic agent actually continues to diffuse and kill additional cells that may be also HER2 negative. So this is part of the power of these drugs that, that by targeting these HER2 low tumors, we can kill both the HER2 positive as well as the HER2 negative tumors. So very wonderful technology that has profoundly changed the care of our patients. And so one of the biggest studies that was reported in the last year and a half was the, the, the DESTINY studies. And here they took patients with advanced HER2 positive breast cancer, and they compared this newer technology with the older technology. And what they found was that patients who got the new technology actually were having better responses to chemotherapy. And most importantly, they were living longer. So, so, so basically overall survival was improved. And even though this was studied in the metastatic breast cancer setting, now it's being tested in the early stage breast cancer setting. Similarly, we're taking tumors that were HER2 low and comparing the new technology to some of our old, old traditional chemotherapies. And once again, we're seeing the new drugs win. They're causing profound success in both hormone receptor positive and triple negative breast cancer. So these are all new drugs that, that are currently available for um, metastatic breast cancer, but they're being tested in early stage setting. So in terms of summarizing the whirlwind of new drugs is that we, we're really using a lot of new drugs in medical oncology, including antibody drug conjugates. We're using more immunotherapy and um, lots of new drugs that are making their way into um, clinical trials. What's new in terms of technologies? I'm just gonna highlight one, which is that we know that um, even in the best of circumstances, our treatments can sometimes cause injury. One common injury is that it can cause numbness or tingling or neuropathy. So we are in the process of trying to secure a clinical trial through one of the National Cancer Institute cooperative groups that actually uses cooling, cooling of the hands and feet, not very different from the cooling of the scalp that we sometimes use to prevent hair loss. And there are some promising data that this device may be helpful. We don't know for sure. That's why it needs to be done as a clinical trial, but this is one of the device that we're hoping to bring to you. 
And what's new in terms of um, better patient experiences? I I wanted to acknowledge um, those of you who know me know that I like to speak as transparently as possible and just want to take a moment to really acknowledge the upheaval that the Yale Breast Program and all of you have experienced going through the last two years of COVID. There's been a lot of change. It's been hard on you as patients, as caregivers, as families. It's been hard on our staff. It's been, it's been, it's been a tough time. And one thing that happened for those of you who've been with us a little longer is that it led to the displacement of our original home, which is on the first floor of Smilo, um, to the fourth floor into a more limited space. And um, that's been hard. And um, this is a national trend where a lot of people have rethought their priorities during COVID? How do they want to work? Do they actually want to work in person or not? So we've lost some great people in the process. So what I want you all to know is that we know these problems are going on. We know some of you have faced access issues. Um, just know that we're actively working on it. We want to hear from you. We deeply care about your patient experience. Um, and just know that we are committed to doing things better. So um, with that, I think this is a duplicate. Let me just double check to get to Dr. Butler's slides. Any questions for me while I'm advancing? <laughs> so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Um, Paris Butler who is Associate Professor of, of Surgery in the Yale Division of Plastic Surgery. He is the Vice Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And he will speak to you about the latest in plastic surgery and breast. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Thank you for the kind invitation and thank you for the introduction. Let's see, just advance what the arrows looks like. Good evening, everybody. Uh, last but not least, the plastic surgeon. Um, it's a delight to spend some time with you this evening. I'm going to do my, my best to give you a whirlwind of breast reconstruction in 10 to 12 minutes. I could usually, I could easily use two hours, um, but I'm going to stick to the 10 to 12 minutes because I don't want to keep you all here all night. Um, I'd like to start by saying I, uh, just recently, I guess within the last six months, uh, joined, um, my esteemed colleagues that you can see here, uh, in the division of plastic surgery here at Yale. There are six of us that perform breast reconstruction and one way, shape, or form. Uh, Bob Hamahawk is our is our division chief. We have uh, Dr. Hare Ayala, uh, myself, Dr. Melissa Mastriani, uh, Dr. Angie Peck, and uh, Dr. Tito Vasquez. Uh, all fantastic, and I'm I'm really fortunate and blessed to work with them. So the goal of breast reconstruction, I get this question all the time, and and frequently like to lead my consultations with it. So in, in theory, the goal of breast reconstruction is to restore the uh, breast appearance in clothes. You know, as a plastic and reconstruction uh, surgeon, I love what I do because I'm restoring form and function, as we say. Um, to restore breast appearance in clothes, I think, honestly, we can do better than that. Uh, we set the bar low, then when we overachieve, then we're applauded more. Uh, I think that we can achieve, uh, you know, breast appearance or the restoration of breast appearance in a bathing suit. Um, but the reality is when you take the bathing suit off or you take off Underwear, you're always going to see the scars. There's no such thing as scarless surgery unless you're operating on a fetus. So uh, once again, we have to have an understanding of what the expectations are. So how often is it performed? Uh, approximately 65% of the time in the U.S. Uh, when a mastectomy is performed, some formal breast reconstruction uh, uh, takes place. So that equates to about 137,000 breast reconstruction operations per year, which is a large number and it continues to grow uh, every single year. So what's the best timing for breast reconstruction? Um, honestly, any time. Uh, we've kind of moved towards a standard, probably too strong a language to say it's a gold standard uh, to do it immediately, uh, but there is some relatively good uh, literature and, and data out there that shows that uh, women have a um, uh, have better social emotional state uh, when they wake up with a breast mound of some sort after a mastectomy has been performed. However, we still do a fair amount of breast reconstruction in the delayed setting. And what does delayed mean? Literally any time uh, after that initial mastectomy has been performed. 
So who's a candidate for breast reconstruction? I would say the vast majority of patients. Um, so basically any woman who has had or is going to have a mastectomy. Uh, there's really no specific age limit. Uh, women over the age of 60 are, are welcome to inquire and can receive reconstruction safely. There, if you look at the literature, there's pretty much two subsets of the community that don't receive breast reconstruction at the same rate as others. Those are our more seasoned, our more seasoned ladies, uh, ladies over 50. Uh, and then unfortunately, our ladies of color. Uh, there are many of us that are out in the community helping to articulate and to, to educate within these communities that they have breast reconstruction options as well. And then um, breast reconstruction is covered by insurance in addition to a balancing operation on the other side. So our country did a phenomenal thing in the late 90s. Our legislators in DC, in my opinion, they got this one right. Um, they passed formal legislation that said if a woman had insurance that was covering any kind of her can breast cancer care, so that's mastectomy, that is um, medical oncology, that's radiation oncology, their insurance company was mandated to pay for breast reconstruction for the duration of their life. This also includes a balancing operation on the other side. So say a woman presents with a left-sided uh, cancer and necessitates a left-sided mastectomy. Insurance company needs to pay for breast reconstruction on that left side and also a contralateral or an opposite side balancing reduction, augmentation in order to help achieve some symmetry. So is breast reconstruction safe? Uh, yes, it is been fairly a uh, hot topic and I'm not gonna dive too far into it, but um, kind of high level uh, breast reconstruction does not make the cancer recur at a higher rate than if no breast reconstruction was performed at all. There are higher complication rates in smokers, patients that are obese and those that are diabetic. So we have lots of uh, counseling sessions around that. Silicone implants have proven to be safe in reconstruction patients. And if they rupture, there is no additional harm to patients. There's lots of misconceptions and mis out there about that. Some of you are potentially read in the New York Times uh, something called anaplastic large cell lymphoma or the fact that breast, uh, breast implants cause lymphoma. The uh, reality is, is that there has been a small association between textured implants and a very rare type of lymphoma. You can see here one in approximately 30,000 women that receive these textured implants develop this rare type of lymphoma. Uh, we say it's the, you know, the likelihood of being struck by lightning um, is greater than developing this rare type of lymphoma. The other thing is the vast majority of us plastic and reconstructive surgeons do not use textured implants anymore. Um, I, I surely don't. I don't know anyone in the, in the Yale practice that does. And then most recently, there's been some, some reports of, of a rare type of kind of skin cancer associated with breast implants. There's been 15 cases reported worldwide. Uh, the FDA has made formal statements saying that they're still studying this. Uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence uh, to, um, to tell us that we need to do anything different with our practices, uh, but we're all kind of wait watching and seeing. And then what are the methods of reconstruction? This is where I could take multiple hours. Um, we get pretty excited about this. So there are numerous ways that we can reconstruct breast mounds. So for me, I, I kind of, when I have consultations with my patients, I, I want to do my best to offer them the full continuum. I actually consider aesthetic flat closure as a, as a type of breast reconstruction. So we have aesthetic flat closure for those that don't uh, uh, desire to have reconstructed breast mounds. We have implant-based reconstruction, and then we have autologous reconstruction. Auto is self. So it's when we use uh, another part of the patient's body in order to make a breast and build a breast mound. Quickly on aesthetic flat closures, uh, it's becoming increasingly popular. Uh, you can see here an article from uh, Annals of Surgical Oncology that articulated that um, one, patients were not all frequently told that this was an option, which is a challenge. And number two, women that did decide to um, embrace going flat, uh, over three quarters of them or close to three quarters of them articulated the fact that they did not have any regret uh, whatsoever. So, you know, as plastic surgeons, we like show and tell. So this is a, a patient of mine who uh, desired uh, to go flat. We've changed our incision patterns as it pertains to um, many of the things um, um, that have evolved when it comes to plastic and reconstructive surgery. This has uh, become an increasingly popular incision, which kind of mimics the what we call the inframammary fold or where the breast meets the chest. And um, many of my, my patients have been quite pleased with it. So the two most common types of breast reconstruction are implant-based reconstruction, where we use an implant to reconstruct the breast mound. And then the second is uh, flap surgery or autologous reconstruction. 
If you look across the country, 75% of the time when we perform breast reconstruction, we use an implant to reconstruct the mound and about 25, it's a little bit higher here at Yale, which uh, I will uh, talk about because we, we do microsurgery. Um, pretty much everyone that I showed you earlier on the board is, is trained in one way, shape or form in, in breast microsurgery. About 25% though, nationwide uh, receive autologous or flap surgery for breast reconstruction. Quickly on implant-based reconstruction, it is usually performed in two stages. That is definitely my preference. Uh, the first stage is done at the time of the mastectomy. I work right alongside our breast surgeons. Uh, after they perform the mastectomy, I place a tissue expander. Uh, I consider this kind of a glorified water balloon that kind of goes underneath the skin or underneath the skin and muscle. And then uh, several months later, as we slowly expand that breast mound uh, to get them to a size that they're comfortable with, um, excuse me, get to this, uh, get them to a size that they like and I'm comfortable with. I say, I don't make video vixens. So we stop at a certain point. Um, we go back, it's usually about two to three months later and we put in a permanent soft implant. So this is a quick uh, depiction of what the tissue expansion process is. You can see here uh, going left to right is the native breast. The mastectomy is performed with, in a skin sparing fashion. This tissue expander is placed underneath the muscle and the skin. And then this needle goes into the port and every other week the patient comes into the office and we slowly fill that tissue expander uh, in order to get them once again to the size of their desire. The second operation, we take out that tissue expander after they've been expanded and we put in that much softer implant. So here's a patient of mine kind of going through the three stages. This was her preoperatively before her mastectomy. This was after her mastectomy was performed uh, and a tissue expander was placed. And this is uh, a couple months later after we had gotten her fully expanded and I exchanged her, ex her expander for implants. This is another young lady is a good example of a unilateral. So she had a left-sided breast cancer. Uh, she actually had a lumpectomy that had positive margins and the breast surgeon thought that she necessitated along with the patient necessitated a mastectomy. So we put in a tissue expander, slowly expanded her. And because of the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 98, uh, and at the time of her exchange for her implant, I was able to do a breast reduction and lift on the other side to enhance her symmetry. So the realities of implant-based reconstruction, for the most part, it's for small to moderate uh, sized breasts. So A to D cup uh, with a non-totic breast. It's a shorter operation. And I think that's another reason that it's performed uh, at a, a higher propensity in this country than autologous uh, surgery or flap surgery. So it's about a you know, three, four hour operation. Patient usually stays uh, one day, but we're working towards sending them home the same day. Um, typically requires the two operations that I, I spoke about. The implants are not good for life. Uh, there are three large implant manufacturers in the country, Mentor, Allergan, and Sientra, and all of them say that the the implants are, are basically good for, for 10 to 15 years. Um, that's when the, the, the likelihood of a spontaneous rupture starts to go up. It's not ideal for patients that need radiation therapy. Uh, and uh, patients, uh, typically, if it's a one-sided uh, uh, cancer and operation, usually necessitate a balancing procedure on the other side. So flap reconstruction. Uh, so flap surgery, once again, is taking tissue from one part of the body and using that tissue to reconstruct a breast mound. It usually um, is taken from the abdomen because most Americans have that tissue to donate. Uh, however, uh, when the abdomen isn't a, a, a source or an, a, an opportunity for us, we can go to the gluteal region. Uh, you can even go to the back. You'll hear terminology like muscle sparing free tram or DIEP or SIEA. That's just fancy medical jargon, basically for an abdominal based flap that we use perforators with blood vessels that actually go down into the thigh. Uh, you can see here is a flap with the small blood vessels that we then take up to the chest and we do our microsurgery under the either our high magnification glasses or the microscope in order to do that microvascular anastomosis. Once again, show and tell, uh, here's a young lady. She had some tissue to donate from her abdomen and we use that tissue to reconstruct a breast mount on uh, that left side. Here's another one of my patients. She had actually failed at another institution, uh, right-sided implant-based reconstruction. She got an infection. We let things kind of settle down. And then she came to see me asking what her options were. She also had some tissue to donate and we reconstructed 
a, uh, a breast mound on that right side. She went on three months later to have nipple areola reconstruction. So the reality is a flat base surgery. It's typically for larger women. So BMI of 30 or more, so it's body mass index. Uh, they want to remain large breasted. We are limited in the size of the implants that uh, the manufacturers make. It is uh, undeniably a longer operation. It's a long day for the patient. It's longer for the, the patient's families, typically because they're taking a nice uh, nap. Uh, it's a longer hospitalization, usually three to four days, because we have to monitor this flap that we um, have anastomosed uh, very closely over the course of those first 48 to 72 hours. There is a, a real risk of hernia or bulge. We say we are robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're taking tissue and a small strip of the muscle from the abdominal wall. And unfortunately, sometimes that can result in a hernia or bulge at the abdomen. It's not for smokers or the super obese. Uh, their complication profile tends to be just too great. Um, and uh, sometimes it's sold as a, a tummy tuck or a, a one and done operation. The vast majority of patients that have this operation do necessitate an additional kind of touch up in order to enhance their, their symmetry and enhance their aesthetic outcome. So question I, I frequently get is, so what about lumpectomy patients? And uh, I'm a big proponent, Dr. Green can, can speak to this, of something called oncoplastic um, reconstruction or oncoplastic breast reduction surgery. So patient presents with a, a large breast and they're diagnosed with a small or modest size cancer, and many of which have always kind of secretly or maybe less than secretly wanted a breast reduction or a breast lift, this is an opportunity for there to be a silver lining where they get their cancer removed and I get to make their breast aesthetically a little prettier. So um, here's an example of a, a woman who had a right-sided breast cancer and always wanted a breast reduction. She developed a, a small cancer and we performed a breast reduction and lift. Uh, these patients do, for the most part, still necessitate uh, radiation therapy as a component of their breast conservation therapy because we're not removing the entire breast. Uh, but we have been fortunate to get some really good results. Here's another woman. She had a left-sided breast cancer. She had always wanted a breast lift. And this is her result after her oncoplastic, her lumpectomy with oncoplastic reconstruction. And then the breasts just get larger and larger. Here's a woman who had desired a, a breast reduction uh, and had developed a right side of uh, breast cancer, and this was the result we were, were fortunate to give her. So in summary, uh, there are many options, and I believe all patients should be offered a consultation with a plastic and reconstructive surgeon to be able to discuss their reconstructive options. I really strongly believed in, in a shared decision-making model. I believe it's critical if you uh, or a loved one goes into a plastic surgeon's office and they're really pushed in one direction or the other without being informed of what the alternatives are. I think that that's problematic and you should likely uh, get a second opinion. Also, if a plastic surgeon's concerned about you getting a second opinion, you should definitely get a second opinion. And then methods and timing that fulfills the patient's needs and lifestyles. As I, as I mentioned, we can do it immediately, we can do it delayed, and um, we're fortunate to have lots of options. So thank you again for your time, attention, allow me to join you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. Any questions for Dr. Butler or any other questions that you guys have had? Yes. Yeah, uh, unfortunately not. The, the, There's the, a question about the type of, type of incident yeah. if you want to answer. It's a great question. So there's a, a, a question about the, the length of the incision on the abdomen as it pertains to the donor site. Uh, we need that, in, that full length. We need the full length not only for the tissue, but we need it for access to get to the blood vessels that frequently go down into the, into the thigh. So... Um, once again, sometimes it's sold as uh, you're getting a tummy tuck at the same time as, as your breast cancer and breast reconstruction. I never sell it that way. I take a lot of pride in my tummy tucks and my incisions a little bit lower, um, but it, it's, a, it's, it's the full length of the incision, unfortunately, that, that we absolutely have to, to use. There's, there, there are some techniques coming out minimally invasively, um, but once again, we, we need the tissue. So it's not just accessing um, the, the area that we need to dissect. And that's where minimally invasive surgery is so great. We literally need the tissue, which is why the longer incision is necessary. One question from the chat and then we'll come to you. 
what decides what decides if implant goes above, above or okay. below the muscle? That's a really good question. Uh, it, it's very complex. Uh, I would say a lot of it is dependent on the thickness um, of the kind of tissue that's left behind at the time of the mastectomy. Uh, I'm a big proponent of, of using the muscle. Um, there are folks that are really getting away from that and just want to put it directly under the skin. There's a lot of emerging literature that talks about um, kind of, I see benefits in, in both directions. For me, the reason I like to put it under the muscle, I think it's a little bit safer. God forbid there's any kind of skin breakdown, the muscles protecting that, that implant or that tissue expander. The other reason is that if the implant or the device is directly under the skin, implants aren't perfect. You can potentially see some rippling. The muscle kind of masks or camouflages any rippling of the implant. The downside of putting it under the muscle is that initially it can be more uncomfortable as you're going through the expansion process. But long term, we've not really seen any difference in, in how the patient feels or, or what have you pertaining to either on top of the muscle or underneath the muscle. as far as uh, having a reduction at the time of the lumpectomy. So could they potentially go and have a reduction or a lift at a later time? Yes, that's a really good question. Uh, and we're seeing an increased number of women that, that want to. There's some plastic surgeons that had, have shied away from it. So we don't have a robust experience. I would say my experience is actually been quite good. I, I usually make them wait until they are at least two years out from their radiation to allow the skin to do its best to kind of to heal and mature. Obviously examine the patient. If they still have radiation changes two years out, then I, I will hold off. But I um, oper operated actually on a, a woman earlier today. We did a breast reduction uh, and a lift on a uh, radiated side. And um, her skin changes were she's three years out. You couldn't really even tell the fact that she had had radiation before. So yes, the, it's absolutely an option and, and something that you should see consultation or whoever should see consultation about um, pertaining to that as an option after they've had lumpectomy and after they've had radiation. Another great question. Yes. Yes. So the, the question is, if a, a woman opts for a mastectomy alone without any kind of formal breast reconstruction and isn't pleased with the remaining redundant skin left behind, could there be anything that could be done? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we, um, and I've had a fair number of patients that at the time either were not, um, did not seek out a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, were not referred to a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. They were just literally trying to get through their cancer care and their cancer journey. And then multiple years later, a desire to have um, kind of a, a cleaning up of the, of the mastectomy uh, flaps and the mastectomy skin. And that, that definitely is an, an option for sure. I think it's dependent upon the kind of the body habitus of the patients also dependent on the, um, how comfortable the breast surgeon is with the, with the mastectomy closure. Uh, there are some, um, particularly our, our ladies that have really large breasts or really totic breasts that I think having a plastic surgeon there at the time of the mastectomy closure, I offer it to all of my, my colleagues here, uh, that were adept and, and happy to do it. Uh, however, if, if that woman doesn't fall into kind of that demographic, the, the breast surgeons don't need us there and, and can close them um, flat without allowing a lot of additional redundancy there. It's yes. So very good question. So is it another operation? And I would say yes. So if, if, if after the mastectomy, the patient wasn't pleased with the amount of skin that was left behind or, or the appearance of the skin, then it would be a second operation. If the patient's not radiated, that can pretty much happen anytime they're done and completed with their cancer care. 
Uh, but if it's been a radiated patient, I would make them make them wait probably six months to a year. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Um, you've been a wonderful audience, both in person and virtually. Thank you for all your questions and know that we're happy to get additional questions as you think of them. Um, just feel free to reach out. Um, you're the center of what we do. So thank you again. <laughs>